Hey Wow TV fam. I just wanted to quickly thank you for being here. Crafting these videos takes time, and if you enjoy what you see, a like goes a long way. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss out on our content and help our community grow. I love hearing your thoughts, so drop a comment with any suggestions or feedback. Alright, let's dive into today's video. Edmund Emil Kemper III entered the world in Burbank, California, on December 18, 1948, as the middle child of Colonel Elizabeth Kemper and Edmund Emil Kemper Jr. Edmund Jr., a World War II veteran turned electrician, faced challenges with Clarnell's dissatisfaction with his occupation. In his own words, he expressed that living with Clarnell was more taxing than his wartime experiences. As a newborn weighing 13 pounds, Kemper surpassed his peers in height by the age of four. Early signs of his antisocial behavior emerged, including cruelty to animals. At the age of 10, he committed a gruesome act, burying a pet cat alive, then decapitating it and mounting its head on a spike. Kemper later admitted to deriving pleasure from deceiving his family about the incident. His disturbing actions escalated at the age of 13 when he killed another family cat, storing pieces of it in his closet. Kemper's dark fantasies and morbid imagination were evident in his youth. He engaged in disturbing rites involving his younger sister's dolls, removing their heads and hands. He also revealed unsettling childhood games such as gas chamber and electric chair, where he had his sister tie him up and act out imaginary executions. Despite having near-death experiences, including attempts by his elder sister to harm him, Kemper maintained a close relationship with his father. However, the family separation in 1957 and subsequent divorce in 1961 devastated him. Sent to live with his mother Clarnell in Helena, Montana, Kemper faced a dysfunctional relationship characterized by her neurotic, domineering, and abusive behavior. Clarnell's actions, such as making Kemper sleep in a locked basement, mocking his size, and belittling him, contributed to a tumultuous environment. At 14, Kemper ran away in an attempt to reconcile with his father in Van Nuys, California. Discovering that his father had remarried, he was sent to live with his paternal grandparents in North Fork, enduring an unpleasant experience due to a strained relationship with his grandparents. The tumultuous dynamics within Kemper's family set the stage for the troubled path he would later tread. On August 27, 1964, at the tender age of 15, Kemper engaged in a horrifying act that would mark a tragic turning point in his life. A heated argument with his grandmother, Maud Matilda, Huey, Kemper, led him to storm off in anger. Seething with rage, Kemper retrieved a rifle gifted to him by his grandfather for hunting. Re-entering the kitchen, he callously shot his grandmother in the head, with her purportedly uttering, Oh, you'd better not be shooting the birds again as her last words. Some accounts also suggest that she suffered additional post-mortem stab wounds from a kitchen knife. Kemper's macabre actions didn't end there. As his grandfather, Edmund Emil Kemper Sr., returned from a grocery errand, Kemper ambushed him in the driveway, fatally shooting him next to his car. Unsure of his next steps, Kemper called his mother for guidance, who advised him to contact the local police. Complying with her instructions, he awaited arrest, seemingly detached from the gravity of his gruesome deeds. In the aftermath of his arrest, Kemper chillingly confessed that he merely wanted to experience the sensation of killing his grandmother. He testified that he murdered his grandfather to spare him the anguish of discovering his wife's death, anticipating the wrath he would face for his own actions. Psychiatrist Donald Lund, who later interviewed Kemper during adulthood, noted that, in his own twisted way, Kemper saw the murders as a form of avenging the rejection he had experienced from both his father and mother. The shocking nature of Kemper's crimes, especially considering his youth, left experts bewildered. Court psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, leading to his confinement in Atascadero State Hospital, a maximum security facility in San Luis Obispo County specifically designed for mentally ill convicts. The trajectory of Kemper's life had taken a dark and irreversible turn, foreshadowing the disturbing path he would continue to walk. During his time at Atascadero, there was a notable discrepancy between the diagnoses provided by California Youth Authority psychiatrists and social workers and those given by court-appointed psychiatrists. 
the former argued that Kemper exhibited no signs of major mental disorders, citing his lack of flight of ideas, interference with thought, delusions, hallucinations, or bizarre thinking. Instead, they found him to be intelligent and introspective, with initial IQ testing revealing a score of 136, over two standard deviations above the average. Subsequent testing later yielded an even higher result of 145. This difference in assessment led to a revised diagnosis for Kemper, now categorized with a less severe condition labeled as a personality trait disturbance, passive-aggressive type. His demeanor and behavior as a model prisoner further endeared him to the psychiatrists at Atascadero. Kemper not only adhered to institutional rules but also took on the responsibility of administering psychiatric tests to fellow inmates. A psychiatrist remarked on his exceptional work ethic, stating, he was a very good worker, and this is not typical of a sociopath. He really took pride in his work. In an intriguing turn, Kemper became a member of the JCs during his time at Atascadero. Additionally, he asserted that he had contributed to the development of new tests and scales on the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, including an overt hostility scale, through collaboration with the institution's psychiatrists. It was during this period that Kemper claimed to have acquired the ability to understand and manipulate the tests, acknowledging that he learned valuable insights from the sex offenders he assessed. This phase in Kemper's life painted a complex picture, showcasing his intelligence, adaptability, and an uncanny ability to navigate within the confines of the psychiatric system. Little did anyone anticipate the dark path that lay ahead for this seemingly cooperative and intellectually gifted inmate. On December 18, 1969, Kemper celebrated his 21st birthday with a release from parole at Atascadero, despite the hospital psychiatrist's reservations. Against their recommendations, he was placed under the care of his mother Clarnell, now residing in Aptis, California. Despite previous remarriages and divorces, Clarnell remained a central figure in Kemper's life. Demonstrating his rehabilitation, Kemper had his juvenile records expunged on November 29, 1972, attesting to his apparent successful response to years of treatment and rehabilitation. During his stay with his mother, Kemper attended community college, aiming to fulfill parole requirements and pursue his ambition of becoming a police officer. Despite being rejected due to his imposing stature, standing at 6 feet 9 inches, he maintained ties with Santa Cruz police officers and became a regular presence at the jury room, a local bar frequented by law enforcement. Unable to realize his policing aspirations, Kemper worked various menial jobs before securing employment with the State of California Division of Highways. Despite his efforts to build a new life, his relationship with Clarnell remained tumultuous, marked by frequent, audible arguments. Kemper recounted the intensity of these clashes, revealing that even mundane topics could escalate into violent verbal battles. Eventually, Kemper managed to move out and live with a friend in Alameda, attempting to distance himself from his contentious relationship with his mother. However, financial difficulties compelled him to frequently return to her apartment in Aptis. In his early 20s, Kemper became engaged to a female student from Turlock High School, a relationship that endured over a year before being terminated due to his second arrest. The identity of the young woman was kept confidential upon her parents' request. In the same period, while working for the highway division, Kemper faced a life-altering event when he was hit by a car while riding his recently purchased motorcycle. The accident resulted in a badly injured arm and a $15,000 settlement from a civil suit filed against the driver. Armed with part of the settlement, he acquired a 1969 Ford Galaxy, and it was during this time that he began noticing and picking up young women hitchhiking. Initially, Kemper claimed to have released around 150 hitchhikers peacefully, adhering to a specific pattern. However, his behavior took a dark turn as he started experiencing what he referred to as little zapples, homicidal sexual urges. Blaming some of the women he later killed for hitchhiking, Kemper expressed frustration with what he perceived as a flaunting of societal norms. This marked the ominous prelude to the chilling acts that would later define his criminal notoriety. Between May 1972 and April 1973, Edmund Kemper committed a series of gruesome murders, claiming the lives of eight individuals. His victims were predominantly female students hitchhiking, 
whom he would lure to isolated areas, including five college students, one high school student, his mother, and his mother's best friend. Kemper's chilling acts during this 11-month spree involved shooting, stabbing, smothering, or strangling his victims. Following the killings, he would take their bodies to his home, where he engaged in horrifying acts such as decapitation, irimatio with their severed heads, necrophilia, and dismemberment. Kemper admitted in interviews that he often targeted victims after having arguments with his mother, who refused to introduce him to women at the university where she worked. He recounted his mother's disparaging remarks, stating, You're just like your father. You don't deserve to get to know them. Psychiatrists and Kemper himself have suggested that these young women served as surrogates for his ultimate target, his mother. One of his earliest victims during this spree was Mary and Pesci and Anita Lucessa, two 18-year-old hitchhiking students from Fresno State University. On May 7, 1972, Kemper picked them up under the false pretense of taking them to Stanford University. Driving for an hour, he diverted the route to a secluded wooded area near Alameda. There, he handcuffed Pesci and locked Lucessa in the trunk before proceeding to stab and strangle Pesci to death, then repeating the same method with Lucessa. Kemper later confessed to an unsettling detail during the abduction, acknowledging that he brushed against Pesci's breast, expressing embarrassment, and apologizing before her murder. Choosing his victims based on perceived class distinctions, Kemper viewed these women as belonging to a higher social class than others he deemed unworthy. After the murders, he transported the bodies in his Ford Galaxy to his apartment, where he engaged in necrophilic acts before dismembering the corpses. Evading suspicion during a police stop for a broken taillight, he successfully concealed the bodies from authorities. Kemper disposed of the victims' remains in plastic bags near Loma Prieta Mountain, and later engaged in further desecration by placing their severed heads in a ravine after performing irimatio on both. Despite extensive searches, only Pesci's skull was recovered in August of that year, while Lucessa's remains remained elusive. The horrifying details of Kemper's actions during this period underscore the depth of his depravity and the tragic loss of innocent lives. On the evening of September 14, 1972, Kemper picked up a 15-year-old dance student named Aiko Ku, who had decided to hitchhike to a dance class after missing her bus. He again drove to a remote area, where he pulled a gun on Ku before accidentally locking himself out of his car. However, Ku led him back inside, despite the fact that the gun was still in the car. Back inside the car, he proceeded to choke her unconscious, rape her, and kill her. Kemper subsequently packed Ku's body into the trunk of his car and went to a nearby bar to have a few drinks, then returned to his apartment. He later confessed that after exiting the bar, he opened the trunk of his car, admiring, his, catch like a fisherman. Back at his apartment, he had sexual intercourse with the corpse, then dismembered and disposed of the remains in a similar manner as his previous two victims. Ku's mother called the police to report the disappearance of her daughter and put up hundreds of flyers asking for information, but she did not receive any responses regarding her daughter's location or status. On January 7, 1973, Kemper, who had moved back in with his mother, was driving around the Cabrillo College campus when he picked up 18-year-old student Cynthia and Cindy Shaw. He drove to a wooded area and fatally shot her with a .22 caliber pistol. He then placed her body in the trunk of his car and drove to his mother's house, where he kept her body hidden in a closet in his room overnight. When his mother left for work the next morning, he had sexual intercourse with and removed the bullet from Shaw's corpse, then dismembered and decapitated her in his mother's bathtub. Kemper kept Shaw's severed head for several days, regularly engaging in Aramatio with it, then buried it in his mother's garden facing upward toward her bedroom. After his arrest, he stated that he did this because his mother always wanted people to look up to her. He discarded the rest of Shaw's remains by throwing them off a cliff. Over the course of the following few weeks, all except Shaw's head and right hand were discovered and pieced together like a macabre jigsaw puzzle. A pathologist determined that Shaw had been cut into pieces with a power saw. On February 5, 1973, after a heated argument with his mother, Kemper left his house in search of possible victims. 
with heightened suspicion of a serial killer preying on hitchhikers in the Santa Cruz area, students had been advised to accept rides only from cars with university stickers on them. Kemper was able to obtain a sticker, as his mother worked at UCSC. He separately encountered 23-year-old Rosalind Heather Thorpe and 20-year-old Alice Helen Allison Liu on the UCSC campus. According to Kemper, he first encountered Thorpe as she exited a building, having attended a lecture. Thorpe entered the front passenger seat and, believing Kemper to be a fellow student, began chatting amiably as he drove. Shortly thereafter, he observed Liu, whom he described as a small Chinese girl, thumbing a ride. Kemper stopped his vehicle, and Liu entered the back seat of his car. Shortly thereafter, Kemper slowed his vehicle, then shot Thorpe in the head with a .22 pistol. He then turned toward Liu as she cowered and squirmed in the back seat of his car. His first two shots missed the terrified girl, although his third bullet hit her in the temple. Their bodies were then wrapped in blankets. Kemper again brought his victims' bodies back to his mother's house. This time he beheaded them in his car and carried the headless corpses into his mother's house to have sexual intercourse with them. He then dismembered the bodies, removed the bullets to prevent identification, and discarded their remains the next morning. Some remains were found at Eden Canyon a week later, and more were found near Route 1 in March. When questioned in an interview as to why he decapitated his victims, he explained, the head trip fantasies were a bit like a trophy. You know, the head is where everything is at, the brain, eyes, mouth. That's the person. I remember being told as a kid, you cut off the head and the body dies. The body is nothing after the head is cut off. Well, that's not quite true, there's a lot left in the girl's body without the head. On April 20, 1973, Kemper was roused from sleep by the return of his mother, Clonel Strandberg, from a party. As she settled in her bed to read, Kemper entered her room, and a brief exchange occurred. Clonel remarked, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Kemper replied, No, good night. Waiting for her to sleep, he stealthily re-entered her room, attacking her with a claw hammer and a penknife to slit her throat. The brutality escalated as he beheaded her and later, as he admitted in a 1984 interview, humiliated her corpse. Kemper recounted placing her head on a shelf, screaming at it, throwing darts, and ultimately smashing her face in. Additionally, he cut out her tongue and larynx, attempting to dispose of them in the garbage disposal, an act that symbolically echoed the years of verbal abuse he endured from his mother. Concealing his mother's corpse in a closet, Kemper went to a nearby bar to drink. Upon returning, he invited his mother's best friend, 59-year-old Sarah Taylor Sally Hallett, over for dinner and a movie. Kemper, however, strangled Hallett to death upon her arrival, placing her lifeless body in a closet alongside Clarnell's. In an attempt to mislead the authorities, he left a note reading, Acts. 5.15 a.m. Saturday. No need for her to suffer any more at the hands of this horrible murderous butcher. Subsequently, Kemper fled the scene, driving nonstop to Pueblo, Colorado, fueled by caffeine pills to stay awake. Armed with three guns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, he believed he was the subject of an active manhunt. In Pueblo, after not hearing news about the murders on the radio, he called the police booth. Initially, the police did not take him seriously, instructing him to call back later. Hours later, Kemper called again, requesting to speak with an officer he knew personally. This time, he confessed to the murders of his mother and Hallett, patiently awaiting the police to apprehend him. In custody, Kemper also confessed to the six student murders. Reflecting on why he turned himself in during a later interview, Kemper expressed the futility of his actions, stating, the original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer. Toward the end there, I started feeling the folly of the whole damn thing, and at the point of near exhaustion, near collapse, I just said to hell with it and called it all off. Kemper faced indictment on eight counts of first-degree murder on May 7, 1973. His defense attorney, Jim Jackson, assigned by the chief public defender of Santa Cruz County, had little recourse due to Kemper's detailed and explicit confession. Faced with limited options, 
the defense pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. During his time in custody, Kemper attempted suicide twice. The trial commenced on October 23, 1973. Despite three court-appointed psychiatrists attesting to Kemper's legal sanity, Dr. Joel Fort delved into his juvenile records and passed diagnosis of psychosis. Fort, even after interviewing Kemper under truth serum, claimed that Kemper had engaged in cannibalism, slicing flesh from his victim's legs and consuming it. However, Fort asserted that Kemper was fully aware of his actions and relished the notoriety associated with being a murderer. Kemper later recanted the confession of cannibalism. California applied the Amnaton standard, requiring proof that the defendant, due to a mental disease, did not comprehend the nature and quality of their actions or, if they did, did not understand that it was wrong. Kemper appeared to know the wrongfulness of his acts and exhibited signs of malice aforethought. Taking the stand on November 1, 1973, Kemper testified that he killed the victims to possess them, akin to possessions. He sought to persuade the jury that his actions stemmed from an aberrant mind, claiming two beings inhabited his body, and when the killer personality emerged, it was like blacking out. After five hours of deliberation on November 8, 1973, the jury declared Kemper sane and guilty on all counts. Despite his request for the death penalty, the Supreme Court of California's moratorium on capital punishment led to a sentence of seven years to life for each count, served concurrently. Kemper was sentenced to the California Medical Facility in Vacaville. During Kemper's trial for the murder of his grandparents, court-appointed psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia. However, this diagnosis was contested by California Youth Authority psychiatrists and social workers at Atascadero State Hospital. They argued that Kemper displayed no flight of ideas, no interference with thought, no expression of delusions or hallucinations, and no evidence of bizarre thinking. Instead, they found him highly intelligent and introspective, leading to a rediagnosis of personality trait disturbance, passive aggressive type. Upon his transfer to the California Medical Facility in 1973, Kemper underwent reevaluation by psychiatrists, resulting in a new diagnosis. He was now classified with antisocial, narcissistic, and schizotypal personality disorders, reflecting a shift in the understanding of his mental health. This complex web of diagnoses highlights the challenges in comprehending and categorizing the intricacies of Kemper's psychological profile. While at the California Medical Facility, Kemper shared a prison block with infamous criminals like Herbert Mullen and Charles Manson. Kemper harbored a particular disdain for Mullen, considering him a senseless killer. He recounted manipulating and intimidating Mullen, even resorting to behavior modification techniques by rewarding him with peanuts for compliant behavior. Despite his chilling history, Kemper has maintained a relatively positive standing within the prison system. He has actively engaged in various activities, scheduling psychiatric appointments for fellow inmates, showcasing his talents as a skilled ceramic craftsman, and contributing to audiobook narrations for visually impaired individuals. However, his active roles were cut short in 2015 after suffering a stroke and being declared medically disabled. In 2016, he received his first rules violation for failing to provide a urine sample. Throughout his incarceration, Kemper has granted numerous interviews, participating in documentaries like The Killing of America, 1982, and Murder, No Apparent Motive, 1984. These interviews have provided valuable insights into the minds of serial killers. FBI profiler John Douglas commended Kemper's intelligence and rare insight for a violent criminal, describing him as friendly, open, sensitive, and possessing a good sense of humor. Kemper, forthright about the nature of his crimes, states that his involvement in interviews aims to prevent others with similar urges from acting on them. He emphasizes the importance of seeking help for those struggling with violent thoughts. Despite being eligible for parole multiple times, Kemper has been consistently denied, with the most recent denial in 2017. His next parole eligibility is in 2024.